Well, let's open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. We're making our way through 1 John, this epistle. 1 John chapter 2. Well, hopefully you, had, hopefully you had a good Thanksgiving. You know, I was thinking about Thanksgiving. Sometimes we have special dishes that we like, and um, maybe your family has a, has a special dish you like to make for Thanksgiving, or, and there's a secret ingredient in it, right? <laughs> Sometimes restaurants have that. They have, you know, their secret kind of recipe, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking, what is the secret to not sinning? And, and, and you know, we've been studying this, because it's, and it's kind of easy. It's according to, if you go back to chapter 1, verse 7 of First uh, John, it tells us right here. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. According to, to 1 John 1, 7, the, the secret to not sinning is right here. It's walking in the light. No one sins when we're walking in the light. It's when we start, start straddling that line between light and darkness. That's when we find sin. And so the truth is, and, and, and you know, until we get our new glorified bodies, we still have to live with this sin nature. We still have to live in this, and and we don't become sinless, but we learn to sin less, right, when we walk in the light. That's the the secret. And so, you know, as Christians, we we have to understand that, that, that if our actions haven't changed since we became a Christian, then something is wrong. And we may be fooling ourselves. And so, if, just, just quickly, so we get caught up. If you go back to chapter 1, verse 9, look what it says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. <clears throat> you know, that word confess, if we confess our sins, it's, it, 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 it could be translated the, to say the same as, if we confess, or to say the same as, or we, to see sin like God sees it. That's what it's saying, if we confess. It's, it's, saying, it, it's saying, you know, I see my sin the way God sees my sin. And, and that God hates sin, and now I have to hate sin. And because I'm calling it what God calls it, I'm seeing the way he sees it, I'm not going to want any part of it, essentially, is that, that word confess. Now, when I confess, what does it tell us? He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin. Praise God. Forgiven and forgotten. In Luke chapter 7, if you remember, the Pharisees, they, they, remember they were, they were mad at Jesus because he ate with sinners? He, he, was, he, was, he was with them. He allowed these sinners to eat with them. And they were, they were so rigid, you know, they, they were so rigid, they missed this opportunity to see Jesus who he really was. Because they were so, they were so upset that he, that he was allowed these, these sinners to eat with them and And I think sometimes that we have to be careful because sometimes we can be a tad bit like the Pharisees, right? And and we almost lose where Jesus, we almost lose where our passion for the Lord and to see him who he really is. And, and, And the truth is the Pharisees, they also had sin that needed to be forgiven. They didn't think that. They they thought they were better than that, but they had sin too. And so we have to understand that we also need humility. We also need to confess, right? We also need to confess our sins and find forgiveness of our sin. Our, our sins might not be on the outside, but they're certainly in the inside. And so 
Um, we can't just cruise through this life, right? Doing whatever we want. Because, you know, sometimes we think, well, God's just so gracious and, and he's so merc- merciful. I can, just, you know, it, I can just run back to him whenever I want. And sometimes we think that. But, but the fact is, John, he continues in this letter in chapter 2 is where we're going to begin today. And look what it says in verse 1. It says, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. And so John, he he begins here this morning. He says, I write these things to you so you don't sin. I'm writing these things, and I think there's a couple thoughts that are implied here. One, as I mentioned earlier, is that that confession, or we might even say repentance, that that repentance, when we repent of our sins, it involves this confession. And and, and again, I see sin as as God sees it. I don't want any part of it, is what that means. But also, we see God in his grace. It, It doesn't want me to sin more. It just wants me to love him more. I love him because he loved me, and the Bible tells us that his kindness, what leads us to repentance. Because he's so good, he's so kind, it leads us to repentance. And so there's a really good lesson here. God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness encourages me to to lead a holy life, right? Because he's so good. And John says, listen, I'm writing these things to you so you don't sin. And this is, I think, the key to understanding I no longer have to sin, right? I'm not in bondage anymore, we might say. And so, again, we need to put everything into context, and we need to remember back in chapter 1, John is talking to us about, remember, fellowship with God? We're fellowshipping. We have this connection with the Lord. And he says that you may not sin. That's, this is God's desire for us as believers. This is his desire that you may not sin, right? And, 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 and so in context, he's telling us that we have, think about this, we have all the resources for, for, for spiritual victory, we might say, to being victorious, And they're all ours in Jesus Christ, through him. All these resources are available to us. Isn't that awesome (laughs) to think about? And so John, he addresses this this relationship, this fellowship that we have with God, the fact that that sin can, sin, what does it do? It breaks our fellowship with God. It breaks our fellowship with God. And he wants to make it clear that, that, that this is not... The, the, the system where we have to break fellowship, but he, he doesn't want this fellowship broken. And so he can, you know, and, and he says, my little children, again, verse one, I write these things so you may not sin. But then he says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness. And then verse two, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He says, we have an advocate. Uh, God's, think about this, God's desire is that you do not sin, and yet he says, if you do, <laughs> there's a provision made. We have an advocate. We, you know, that, that word, it can mean defense lawyer. <laughs> we have a defense lawyer. <laughs> I have a friend, and, um, a fr- fr- friend from years ago, and he used to get speeding tickets a lot. <laughs> And, um, and he knew this lawyer in Seattle that he just would pay him $1,000 and then no questions asked and he would just go, it would just go away. <laughs> He'd never have to even show up for court. This lawyer would just take care of all of it and he would get this clear record and it happened more than once. <laughs> and so he'd do this. But th- th- that's what it's saying. We have this defense lawyer. We have this advocate that, that is Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus, he's our defender. And when we sin now, God, listen, he's not shocked at human behavior. He understands, right? 
But, but he's seen this all in advance. And, and in verse 3 of chapter 2, John, he, he now, he, he, he turns the, this, this second characteristic as he discusses, the, as he continues this discussion, but really how we are to love in this. And let me just read the context here. I'm going to read verses 3 through 11 so we understand this, then we'll go back through it. Verse 3, it says, Now, by this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. And he who says, I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and to you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is uh, in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light. There's no causing for stumbling in him, in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So going back to verse 3, it says, Now we, we know this, that we know him if we keep his commandments. That word, we know, and, and now this, we know. That word, we know, it's the, the Greek word, gnosko. It's to know, it's to learn to know. It's this knowledge, it's, 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 it, we could say it's, it, this knowledge, it's, it's uh, grounded on personal experience. You know, as Christians, to know, we, we often talk about as Christians to have this relationship with the Lord, right? To know Him. You know, we don't just know about God, we actually know Him. We know God. But we have to, we have to come to know Him, we have to experience God in that way, that's, this is the key to the Christian life. We know God. We know him. We don't just know about him. Some, a lot of people know about God. But we as Christians, we get to know him. That's the word. What are the commandments as it talks about here in, in, in verse 3? Well, when you hear the word commandments, what do we think of? We think of the Ten Commandments, right? We think of the commandments of God. We, we, we think about, uh, you know... Uh, keeping his commandments, you know, and, and, and look at verse 4, it says, <clears throat> and verse 3, if we keep his commandments, he who says, I know him, and does not keep the commandments, is a liar, and the truth's not in him. And then verse 5, whoever keeps his word, tr truly the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we're in him. You know, if you think about the Ten Commandments, remember the Ten Commandments? They were written on stone, and these two stones, and they were given to Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus. The first tablet, you know, the first tablet contained this requirements concerning man's relationship with God, you know? And the second tablet, the, uh, the laws concerning man's relationship with man. So the first Man's relationship with God, the second man's relationship to man. And when John says, he who knows him who keeps his commandments, is it referring to the Ten Commandments? Is that what he means? And I would say yes and no. <laughs> because we know that Jesus, in Matthew chapter 22, remember when he said, what is the greatest commandment? They asked him that question. Remember what Jesus' response was? He said, Jesus, he said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And then this is the first and greatest commandment. And, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he goes on to say, these, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And so in his response, Jesus, he narrows the Ten Commandments down to two. He kind of simplified it. It's the law of God and, you know, the law of Moses and, and these two commands. Jesus, in a sense, he, Jesus said, hey, I'm going to make this really simple for you guys. 
You know? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And see, if, if we focus on these two things, listen, if we focus on those two things, everything just falls into place. Everything falls into place. And so John says, if we, if we know him, if we keep his commandments, <clears throat> I think this is what he might be referring to here. The commandment to, to love God and to love others, right? And this is very simple. I, I, it, as a matter of fact, I, I love how God makes things easy for us. <laughs> you know? Now, <clears throat> the reality is, though, I think that these commandments are easy to follow when life is going well. You know, when, when we have money in the bank and our family's healthy and we're sitting in Starbucks having a latte and life is good, <laughs> and I, say, I can say, I love God. God's so good. But do you still love God when the funds dry up? When your family is struggling with some health, when you're between jobs, when you're barely making ends meet? See, see I think it, it just comes down to our obedience to the Lord results in, you know, in having this loving, mature relationship with God no matter what, right? I think, I think we'd all agree it's easy to love God when everything is going well. But when things are hard, it is, it, it's, it's more difficult, isn't it? And the, the idea of God's love becomes more real, when, you know, when you have to go through those struggles and those challenges, and, and yet that's when we get in line with God and what he wants for our life. We get on the same page as God. You know, a husband and, and wife, they love each other, but if they... If, if, if they, you know, don't serve each other, if they, if they don't cultivate a, a loving relationship with each other, it's, it, you know, it, it can be hard. And it's the same thing is true with God. When we put God as a priority and we, we, we begin to experience that, that deeper, uh, you know, more mature uh, uh, relationship with the Lord, that's, that's when it, 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 makes it, it makes it better, right? It makes it real. Look at verse 6. He says, He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. You know, this is the second time that John uses this phrase, phrase abides. Abides, it means to remain in, it, it, you know, to, to be connected. And again, we see this relationship that we have with Jesus. We've been, we, we, we're, we, we are to be close to him. We are to abide in him. We are to be connected to him. Jesus, remember, he used the same word. He painted this picture, this relationship with a believer. He, he, he used a, a member of vine and branches. And Jesus said, I'm the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, I'll remain in you. If you abide in me, I'll abide in you. And John 15. And then he, he goes on, he says, if you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. You'll bear fruit. And then he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. And so Jesus, you know, it's a big, biting in Jesus is a big deal. It's a big deal to him. And so how, I think the question is, how do we know we're abiding in him? Well, again, Jesus said it's all about the fruit. It's all about, all about what we're producing you know, it's, 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 is there fruit in our lives? Is our, is our life bearing fruit? Now, the second thing to note here is how is this commandment new? Look at the, 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 the verse in verse 7. There's a new emphasis here. In verse 7 it says, Brethren, I write, to you, write no new commandment to you, but I have had from the beginning, the old commandment is the word which you have heard from the beginning. And then verse 8 says, again, a new commandment I write to you, 
which thing is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. Now, at first glance, it, it, we, doesn't it almost seem like a contradiction here? I don't write you a new commandment, but here's a new thing. <laughs> right? He says, I'm not writing this new commandment to you. And then, and then uh, what does he mean? Well, there's actually two Greek words in the, for, in the language here for the word new. There can be a new in time or, you know, this emphasis or this quality. Example, you could use this word to describe the latest model of a car, right? I have a, I have a new car. I have uh, the 2024. I have the latest model, the Tesla, <laughs> whatever, right? But it's still a Tesla, you see? And so, you know... Uh, it, you, it can be a the, 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 you know this new and quality, the greatest new thing, and, the, and and so John, when he says, "I write to you no new commandment to you," in verse seven, he does not mean new in time, not something new that you haven't heard before, right? In fact, you've known this from the beginning. He says, from the beginning of their faith, you've known this. It wasn't. An afterthought in God's mind. Oh yeah, by the way, about being saved, I also want you to love one another. Or, you know, it wasn't an afterthought. This, this, it, you know, Jesus. As I mentioned earlier, he, Jesus explained this. He summed these up. I want you to love God, and I want you to love others. It wasn't a new thing. It was just this is from the beginning. This is what I've wanted. It's not a brand new thing that I'm talking about. It was just new in emphasis, you know, new in in quality because in a way it had never been demonstrated before. But it was demonstrated through the life of Christ, right? Jesus demonstrated this to us. I want you to love God and love others. Didn't Jesus do an amazing example of that? So this new and this emphasis as it it talks about here. Jesus used the same word, this new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He was giving a commandment, a new emphasis. As I have loved you, Jesus is our example. In verse 8 it says, which thing is true to him? Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you? Jesus, in a sense, he has loved, he loved them and he demonstrated this life in Jesus and the love of Christ led them to this, you know, to, to come to this earth and to be a servant, to give up his life. In 1 John chapter 4, we're going to be reading about how God is love and and Jesus, he, he, he did this through his life. He, he showed us how to love and how to love God and how to love men. You know, in, in Luke chapter 15, it records that even the worst of sinners drew near to him. Can you imagine? It says even the worst of sinners drew near to Jesus. You know, they were used to the religious leaders of their day coming down on them. You know, people were used to, 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 to people laying guilt trips on them, but not Jesus. He, he, he was a burden bearer. He would take on their burdens, and, 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 and he, he loved, in a sense, the crowds. He, he took care of people. He, he loved them. Now, I don't like crowds. I don't know about you guys. Anybody like Disneyland? Any? Or not? I don't, I don't like the crowds of Disneyland. Isn't it crazy? I know that I'm a little bitter towards Disneyland because my parents never took me when I was a kid. And so I went when I was 20 years old with two of my buddies. I was like, I want to go to Disneyland. And so we went, and it was in the summer, and it was packed. <laughs> and I just remember, just, this is what it's like standing in line all day. Anyways, I'm a little bitter Towards it, but anyways, it was packed. I was anxious, and 
You know, the disciples were kind of like that. They didn't remember like the crowds. They're like, get away from Jesus. You know, the kids would come to Jesus, get away, kids. <laughs> but Jesus, he, he wasn't annoyed. He wasn't annoyed by the people. He welcomed it. No, come. Let, it, let him come. He wanted to heal people. He wanted to minister to people. He wanted people to come to him. But, you know, I think, especially maybe in this season, sometimes, do you ever feel inconvenienced by people? Do you ever feel inconvenienced? You know, you're planning on something, but then something comes up. And this can happen to all of us, right? It, it, you know, uh, we can be, be inconvenient. Now, I, I like to say this. As a pastor, I don't ever want to feel inconvenienced. But it, we do sometimes. But, you know, that's what we're here for, for people to call and to, to minister and to do that. And, and that's what Jesus did. Jesus looked upon people with compassion. And he loved them. He saw them with, like sheep without a shepherd. And so he welcomed them. He touched the lepers. He, he, he ministered to the outcast. You know, he was patient. He was consistent. He, 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 even in the unbelief of his disciples, he ministered to them in that way. And the, the greatest demonstration of love was seen on the cross. As Jesus went to the cross for us, he, he loved you and he loved myself and, and so that we can experience this joy. Jesus, his focus was not, on, was, was not only on the individual, but his focus was on the world. You know, he, he, he wanted the world and, you know, to see things differently. You know, God's focus is on the world today. His love for the world is his heart for the world. No, I think Jesus, he knew that, that people would be struggling. You ever, you, know, you ever struggle with loneliness? I think everybody, probably all of us, have at one point in time struggled with loneliness. And Jesus knew that. You know, sometimes it's loneliness, sometimes it's emptiness. You ever just felt empty inside? You know, sometimes we do that. We, you know, that... The, uh, I read this article and it said that <clears throat> the person had placed an ad in, in, a, in the classified online or in the newspaper or whatever it was. And it said something like, I will listen to someone talk for 35 minutes for, you know, 20 bucks an hour or something like that. And he got like 20, 10 to 20 calls a day. Because people, they, they want someone to, to talk to because they're lonely. You know, people are consistently trying to fill their lives with things because there's this emptiness. And I think that, that as we come into this, like, Christmas season, I think we have to understand that and realize that and know that people are lonely, people are empty, and, and they're filling their lives with all these things and stuff and, and, and because, because of that. They're trying to fill that void. But the answer is What? I mean, Jesus knew that we'd be dealing with all these types of struggles and his heart went out to people, but what's the answer? Well, it's the church. I mean, the church is where we come and we fellowship and, and we, we lift our praises to Jesus because Jesus wanted to, see, wanted to see the church love. Jesus wants to see us live his love shine through us. That's what he wants. And so, when Jesus declared that all the commandments were summed up in these two, love God with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself, I, I believe this. If, if you love God with all your heart, you will find that he'll be working in you. He'll be making you a person that naturally starts beginning to love others. He wants that. He wants that. So, Lord, we thank you 
for the text today. We thank you for this time. Lord, I want to pray for anyone right now who's lonely, anyone who's empty, anyone who's struggling, Lord. I pray that they would turn to you. I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would come to you because you're really ultimately the only one that can feel that emptiness, that loneliness, Lord, that no matter where we are in this world, no matter what's happening to us, we can cry out to you, Lord. We can come to you. You can be there with us in these times. And I just think of this, this season that, that we're going into and we get to celebrate you coming to this earth, Lord. And just that we as Christians might just realize the people around us, Lord, and that we would maybe have extra patience and extra love and extra kindness for those and, and realize that they might be even struggling with other things, Lord. And so we pray that we'd be like Jesus, that we would take these words that were read today and that we would think of you and, and that you, Lord, would just be shining through us, Lord, that we would be people, that we'd be Christians who are walking in your light. So help us, Lord. Fill us up, Lord. I, I lift up each of us today. In Jesus' name, amen.